Okay, this is the um, meeting of the Invasives Remediation Working Group on September 19th at 7 o'clock. Um, welcome all. Thank you for coming. Um, as you know, the July minutes are pending, so we do not have to approve them. Um, I We do want to discuss what Sandy had to say about what's going on. I will also share with you, I spoke to him and gave him the delineation that we came up with early on of the ABC area so that we're all talking about the same spaces mm -hmm. because he was he did not realize what we were talking about. But we are now all on the same page. So, and, and for your benefit, uh, Victoria, the A section of the garden is the area immediately in front of the pond. The B section is to the left if you're still facing the pond. And the C section is the area immediately behind the garden. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so any comments about what uh, Pam shared with you about Sandy's comments as far as what he has done? Do you have someone on staff who's a licensed, um, who is licensed to uh, apply herbicides? No. Okay. So then that would go to bid? Is that how that would work? Are we talking about just with the trees of heaven? Yes, because I thought that was the primary um, point he was making in his comments. Right. You might want to, maybe we want to read those comments publicly because I know Victoria didn't get them. Okay. Do we want to read those and make it a public comment? I mean, a public document. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'm going to find them. Mary Louise, do you have them that you can read out? Hold on. Um, hold on. Let's see. Um, just a second here. Oh, all right. I, I, I found them. Uh, he said, we've not yet begun our invasive work in the back area of Cherry Lawn. That would be the C section, but I'm hoping to start next week. Right now, the plan is to clear out all of the vines, mugwort, and dead damaged trees and put grass seed down in its place with the potential of adding some plants, trees, shrubs at a later date. When we are finished, my intention is to have the area cleared and seeded in a way that it can be added to our regular mowing routine so that nothing, with the exception of grass, will aggressively grow back. The work will be done during regular and OT hours as the months go on, and I will keep track of all the hours that are dedicated to this project. Now that we have the stump grinder, we will also be taking care of all of the stumps that are located in that back area of the park and any other stumps that are left behind from the removal work that we're doing so that the area is flat and able to be mowed. I also plan to bring the bucket truck up there to get high up into the trees and clip more of the vines out that were left behind. This will be something that we will do at a later date after we get further along with the land clearing below. Once we are finished at Cherry Lawn, the plan will be to head back down to weed and grind the stumps that were left in the back area of the park that we cleared last winter and then begin working in the short lane area of the park. We have been back to pear tree to cut and remove new growth, FYI, just because we cut the trees down, the tree of heaven trees, they are coming back. Um, okay, so he said, we've been back to pear tree to cut and remove new growth from the trees of heaven that we cut down near the picnic area. I also have the quote from Mike Cotta to remove all of the tree of heaven that are still located in Maguan and Baker Park. The spotted lanternfly has been seen at Maguan and Cherry Lawn, which means it's probably at all of our parks now. Um, that was pretty much it. I also have the quotes that he gave me for removing the trees that he referenced at both Maguan and Baker. Um, 
it comes to, we, and I will also say, he has not dipped into our budget for this year, and our budget is 15000 Um, So that's still open. We have a total. Who do you mean by, could you confirm who you mean by he? Are you talking about um, Sandy Rich, who is our Parks and Rec supervisor, or were you talking about, because you just referenced my Kata? Um, no, I'm, talk, I'm talking about Sandy, what Sandy has okay. done to date. So he has not dipped into our 15000 Okay. Great. The quotes going forward for the trees, the tree of heavens, that which, which have been identified are, there are seven tree of heavens behind the handicapped parking area at Maguan that will cost $2,900. There will be six tree of heavens behind Challenger Field and Playground at Maguan for a total of $3,800 and two trees behind first baseline of the Little League field at Baker for a total of 1,900, which altogether adds up to 8,600. Now, I will tell you, there are probably a zillion more tree of heavens out there that we have not ID'd. And I don't think going forward, we're gonna be able to pay to take down all these bloody trees. Uh, there's a lot of research that is going on to eliminate this the the spotted lantern fly, but they don't have a solution yet. Um, so one answer would be when we do ID a tree of heaven and do cut it down to apply some sort of herbicide, which I know we don't want to do, but it is the only way to really get rid of it. And unfortunately, the tree itself is actually a very attractive, fast-growing tree, which is why it's People everywhere in the them. world these days. Um, and unfortunately, the, the downside is this bug, which has chosen to move in. One of the things that I said to Mary Louise earlier today was I brought it up before. I and um, Laura, um, I talked to Mary Bloomer about this today, and she actually recommended you. And I said, Laura, you know, you're already on our invasives with us, but maybe we could get somebody else. Like, so there's two people. Uh, this isn't the how are we going to handle it within Parks and Rec, but this is the long term suggestion that we start, you know, a column in the newspaper or social media um, where twice a month or during core seasons, we start to help people identify what the tree of heaven is, what it looks like, because there's one that looks a lot like it, but it's not. So we don't want them taking down the wrong tree. So that's number one. Um, you know, obviously, we've talked about this. If you go on the Penn, Penn State. Oh, you muted yourself, Patty. And it's the Penn State site. You're muted. Yes. <laughs> Have I been talking the whole time and saying yeah. how pretty you all look? <laughs> right. right. You're talking right. about Penn State. All right. right. I'll cut to the chase. Basically, uh, I think that we've I've talked about this before. It'd be great if we can start a educational campaign. I talked to Lori McGrath, who I know, um, obviously, we have Laura Mosier on our committee, Mary Bloomer. If we could start something in the newspaper or social media where we're doing something twice a month, educating people about the spotted lanternfly, the tree of heaven, what to do, how to make sure you're not cutting down the tree of heaven, the tree that looks like the tree of heaven, but it's sumac. not. That's a staghorn sumac is Thank the look you. like. Okay. And well, that's that a, a, a native plant. Sumac. And so, so, in fact, we can do photos, you know, of both to show how to identify the difference. Um I saw a tree here in town where they had a bunch of the spotted lantern flies on that. And I raced back and I grabbed the fly swatter and I was doing my best to, to eliminate them. Um, I also saw the engorgement on the trees. So I feel like I've now seen several cycles and I learned a lot from reading that Penn State yeah. website. So right. I knew, 
what the engorgement looked like, the laying of the egg, so to speak, and the different colors as the la spotted lantern fly. So my only point was, Laura, if you can work with me on it, I mean, I I'll can submit it to these social media sites, but I think, and, you know, even the moms of Darianne, the gardener, website, et cetera, but <coughs> we're focused on the parks and rec and we need to be continue to focus on parks and rec, but I think we can also do an educational thing that's ongoing. And I think Patty, where did you see those? They were at Cherry Lawn. And unfortunately, they were, you know, the three trees that are behind the tennis courts between the tennis courts and the pond yeah. that the guys had really cleared out. They were so overgrown with yeah. weeds. And then we were thrilled by how cleared cleared out they all were. And there's still vines hanging. And Laura, as you'd said, you don't ever want to yank on vines. You want to yeah. clip them and let them fall. I'm very happy to see here Sandy's going to be clipping the next stage of it because I would love to see those cleared up and cleaned up before the um, the dedication, if that's possible to do that with the gazebo there, if we can, if we can't, it's okay. But that's where I saw about 14 of them. Susan Daly, she was either with me that day or it was the next day when I went back. Yeah, um, I'd love to have you show me that, Patty. Um, yeah, they weren't there today and they weren't there yesterday. So I continue I to check. Yeah, I one did. Other, one other interesting thing: there are two Tree of Heavens actually in the Cherry Lawn Gardens that have sort of seated themselves in individual gardens inside the gardens. Inside, yeah. the, you know, in individual gardens, two of them. Yeah. So, so the difference to, there, Mary Louise, is you have pretty, you know, um, people are pretty sophisticated in the gardening industry, so to speak. So if you identify that they are there constantly, they will get rid of it and they'll know how to continue to get rid of it. We always knew that even if we took down that tree of heavens, we were going to, you remember Chris Fillmore talking to us about this a year yeah. ago. It's a battle plan. <laughs> that was his phrase. It's a battle plan. We have to continue to work on it. Yeah. Um, um, I did communicate with Jim Cameron earlier in the summer and he'd be more than willing to work with us to do a, a TV 79 piece that, you know, right. would then be up for people. And then we would want to advertise that the educational piece is in the TV 79 library, of course. Promote it. Um, right. But yeah, he was very willing to work with us on putting that together. Excellent. So, Laura, not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to ask but, you. Are but you, you want to be a movie star? Yeah. So if you would, if you feel comfortable and you know, Jim, obviously from all your years on the RTM, if you're comfortable with it, you're such a great speaker on it as well. I might Why, thank you, Patty. Recommend that you be <laughs> our keynote speaker. <laughs> mm, sure. Um, the thing to know about, in addition to seeding, the tree of heaven sends out runners. So you might find a daughter tree a hundred feet away from the mother tree and they're connected. So the, this is really the nightmare of all nightmares is this Can you tree define of runners? So are you saying there's a root underneath that's a hundred feet away? It can okay. be as, as far away as a hundred feet. Okay. And it would be a root. Okay. Thank you. Is it kind of the idea of wild strawberry, how you have a little patch here and then it's all underneath yeah. and then yeah. it pops up way over there? Yeah, in, in a sense. Yeah, exactly. So. Do you kind Hello? of feel like, you know, when you watch some of those alien movies and you're like, yes. we got to defend our town. Correct. You know, I, I said I was driving it's like back. like we're under attack. Yeah. yeah. I, well, I was driving I, back I, from Maine, I, Vermont, and all I could hello? see was like those invasives all the way up and down yep. the highway. But we can't, we, you know, Department of Transportation, those guys are going to have to handle that. But if we can handle our own town and really educate people, we'll be able to keep our healthy main, uh, main trees. Which is hello? So, so Mary Louise, you said the total hello? was what, 8,200? Um, 8,600. 8,600. So Pam, with that come out of our invasives budget. Does Hold on one second. To, uh, Susan, we can hear you. I, I heard you saying hello. She's oh, on I just a phone. Want to make sure. Oh, I just want to make sure you could hear me. I couldn't tell. Thank you. Yep. 
Um, as for the the money of the of the trees of heaven, um, you know, it is part of it is part of the invasive work that we're doing. So I would say that that would be something we we would think about. Um, maybe we do, you know, half of them. Um, um, I do think we need to get another quote because we have one. Mike yeah. tends to be lower priced than some of the other vendors. Um, but um, so that wouldn't come out of your tree budget. I know you'd like it to. <laughs> Just I don't think we should take it out of the tree budget, Lori, because when we have storms, Pam mm -hmm. really needs that, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, more and I more trees are, are coming down, and and yeah, so and I, Sandy I wasn't we, too big on taking uh, using that. Well, I think okay. message, what we should do is maybe take a look at um, looking at where our tree maintenance account is in the in the middle of spring and see how we how we dealt with it all year long, and if there's some additional funds left over there, it'd be fine to take it from there. Yeah, but you need that for that tree in the middle of Cherry Lawn too, the the pond, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, that's yeah, a priority because we got to get I, that out before the aerator goes in. Not necessarily. No. Did you? But they they can put the aerator in with the tree there. We but should. But we should. We got to get it out. The thing is, though, I think we need to contact some neighbors on the other side. If we can enter from the other side, it probably wouldn't be six thousand plus. It's the fact of getting a crane over the pond to to lift up that tree. So I Andy know said it's the it's laid there for so long that it's the the or Sandy and Paul quick that it's the um you know it's the size but it's the depth it's the pulling it up mm -hmm. and out and so um yeah I mean I'm sure we can talk to neighbors but back to the sensitive subject I would say of you know I don't know do we do half of these trees come down and the other half we try the very targeted pesticide um can i ask you a question this is susan daly i sent that uh paperwork to you guys about dealing with the tree of heaven mm -hmm. um and laura i just i just jumped on and i must I apologize if you guys already spoke about this but once you cut those trees they send out those runners and they get even a more a higher velocity velocity of it and it's quicker there's so many of them that pop up and now you're spraying in so many places and the new strategy is to just chop at the bark and apply the pesticide and let the tree die back. And then you know that the tree is dead before you cut it down. Because once you cut it down, the tree then knows it goes into the stress mode and it starts making more of those uh, runners and sprouts. And you saw it at Wheat Beach because I was there recently and there's yep. tons of tree of heaven just popping up in different places. And I just think that just to ruin, ruin remove them for the sake of removing them isn't the best strategy if we're going to end up using pesticides, which is what we're trying to prevent now, even more in the future, because there's so many places that they're going to come up. And the only way to remove them is by using pesticides. In well, I concur, locations. Susan. Um, basically, also, con I mean, Laura, I know that you're really against pesticides, but if we're having all these runners and we're having documented evidence of what we already paid to take down at um, Weed Beach, right, then uh, when you talk about chopping at the bark, can you define that a little so bit it's more, like a basil Susan, well, at the lower you, part? Yeah, if you looked at the paper that I sent you from Penn State, that's yes. pretty much the seminal work on it. And it's basically, you cut it deep enough so that you you're, you could apply the chemical into the past that bark layer that it goes into their system, you know, into their, um, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not a master gardener, as all of you know, but it does go into, it goes into the root, especially now at this critical moment is when you do it right before when they're absorbing all the nutrients for the root system. And so when it just goes down, it goes into the roots and it kills the tree. And I mean, there's been a lot of great, you know, evidence that supports that this works. And then the tree so the, slowly dies and you see it right away and the leaves start to drop. Everything happens. And then you're like, okay, the, all the leaves are dropping. This tree is ready to get chopped now. But so how low, low, the, the, how low cutting, apply it. The, the cutting is and, done but, but in intervals all the way around the tree. Thank you. Yeah. Who would do that? It goes, it goes you I would need a license. I mean, we could call, yeah, you like a, a tree person. or something like that. Like companies that actually do this 
I would trust them. I wouldn't do it like personally. I think it's important to get someone like Laura says licensed that they do this stuff. It's very common and we should have them just take a, 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 you know, a first stab at it and see if it works. And then only when it looks like the tree is dying or dead, do you chop it down? Because before you do that, if you do it after, before that, you're just going to create more tree of heaven. You're basically, you know, creating a, a whole forest of tree of heaven if we keep on doing this. That is like and the alien so movie. <laughs> and yeah, since it, it's it done, is like the alien movie. Since it's all targeted, you, you don't run the risk of damaging surrounding trees because you're going right into where you've made cuts in the bark. That's what, that was my question. Thank you, Laura, for defining that. I was worried about runoff, how it was affecting the other air around it, but it's just cutting within the tree in certain sections and it rolls into like, it. Okay, thank you. Like right now, if we decided to go back and hit all those runners and those little baby trees that are coming out, we're going to have to hit the leaves. And the leaves, you do run into potential for runoff because what happens is if you, you apply it on the leaves and it rains or something happens, there's more of a likelihood of that coming happening, you know, the runoff problem. Whereas into the bark, it goes into the root system and kills the tree without hopefully. So you're talking about at Weed Beach? Yeah, I'm taking, well, no, no, I just meant where you were talking the about the tree. leaves and that you, that you said we're going back and going after the runners. You're talking about it. We'd be yeah. taken down. I mean, if yeah. you look at the, the, I'm sure any licensed person that can do this, there's all these, like, if it's X number, you should do this. As, as, if it's a certain diameter, you can still do the cut and put paint it into the bark. I mean, there's not, there's less bark in smaller trees, obviously, but you could try. But they recommend typically hitting the leaves on those smaller trees which, you know, you then run the risk of, you know, runoff, I think, a little bit more. Everybody have a good meeting. I got to jump off. Okay. okay. Good you. luck, Pam. But thank you, Pam. So, so I think the next step should be to talk to, like, a, a company, like, maybe Save a Tree or something, like, like of that level. I'm not saying that company in particular. And find out if they do do what we do, the bark application and the cuts, and see if they will do it for us. And Laura, do you work closely with the see. Bartlett? Laura Motion? No, not, not, no, not for, oh, okay. Not for tree removal or anything like that. It's, I only work at the Arboretum itself. Okay. Well, it would seem to make more sense to, to pursue this avenue rather than spending 8,600 to cut these trees down, which is an interim solution. Agreed. Um, so we, it would be the 15,000 would be better spent um, attacking these trees from that perspective. So perhaps the next step to take is to find out who does this and how much it's going to cost and how many trees we can um, eliminate. And then uh, worry about cutting the trees down when they're dead, maybe in the spring or whatever going forward. Or over time, depending on over where they're time. placed, it might not be urgent. Correct. Correct. Do you all agree? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great plan. Okay. Yes. Okay, I can make some calls and um, see what I can find out. You know, I have noticed that the lantern flies hang out a lot on the invasives, like um, behind the garden, there's that trail, and they hang out on the mugwort there, um, and a lot of, like, the bittersweet, you know, we have sometimes little shoots that come up in the outdoor classrooms, um, and they tend to just hang out on, I mean, it makes sense, right? They're not, they hang out on the plants that are from where they're from, um, right. but I think that that is helpful that we are removing those you know, the vines, the invasives, that's definitely a helpful step. I notice the adults like to hang out there. Correct. <laughs> I mean, I don't think we would have noticed, we wouldn't have probably even known that the lantern fly was there if we hadn't done so much work on um, the invasives at Cherry Lawn on that lower end by the pond where all those trees are to clear out. So that, I guess it's the silver lining of doing all of that work because then it could have just been really bad and continued. Um, but now we know where we can kind of target. 
okay. one of those trees. So there's three trees. One is not an invasive. I mean, one is not a tree of heaven. There's two that are. One is in pretty bad shape already itself. And then the other one um, is halfway there. So, um, you know, I. At, at Cherry Lawn? At Cherry Lawn. Laura, if you go down, it's between the pond and the tennis courts. It's that three grouping where it was so, you know, it was, there was so much you couldn't even see through it. And now sure. we have that beautiful open area we can see through it. But if you go down, you'll see, you'll see which two I'm talking about. So oh, all of a sudden I was like, oh God, I hate taking down trees and seeing that. But then I saw the 14 lanternflies. So I was like, oh, but so that's an example where, I mean, if we want to beta test it, those two trees are the perfect places to do it right, right now, I would say, if we could find somebody to come in and do that, that can be our beta test. Okay. Yeah. I think that one tree was, wasn't that, was, what was, what was that tree? I was with you that time when we, I did the snap history for that. Yeah. The one to the it left was, was fine. Too. Yeah. You took pictures of it. And I, I grabbed the leaves from there also just to double check, but it's the two. Yeah. The one, the bigger one to the left that has the most leaves and everything on it. It's got a lot of vines that, that is not it, but the other two, now you can see that they are because you can, you can actually see the leaves. So, hey, I have a quick question back to Maguan for a minute um, before we do any work, whether it's um, whether it is doing the targeted, which is how it sounds like it's going to go. Are we sure that the trees behind the challenger field are actually on park property and it's not town? It's not the residents property because that the challenger field goes pretty far back. So that's the only thing I'd want to check. Okay. Uh, Mary, Mary Louise, I can I go will. and check the, um, I can go into whatever planning and zoning and check our border. Pam might have it. She's off the phone now. But yeah, we may have a survey of the park. Correct. Okay. Would you do that, Pat, Patty? I will. Okay. All right, and I will uh, contact some uh, tree companies and see if we can come up with someone um, who's an expert in applying this herbicide. Yeah, yeah I'll get you the name from my husband um, of a guy that we use to feed our trees and do some stuff. He's the guy that we got from um, Karen Hewen, actually, that we use. Okay. So I'll, I'll get that name and send it to you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, and of course, the tree, the lanternfly is laying its eggs right now as we speak. Um, and they will all emerge in May. So um, we have to be moving on this. Yeah, absolutely. And then part of that whole educational plan. So I everybody's mean, ready in May with their fly swatter. <laughs> um, you know what it was, Patty? I looked it up. It was the butternut tree. The one that on the was, left. There, there was one. Yeah, yeah. that's the butternut okay. tree because it has a. Oh, it's got an interesting leaf structure, and the others were free of heaven, where we saw all that spotted lantern fly when we were Thanks, standing Susan. there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, Pam also mentioned because we're getting we're doing so much, we need someone to take minutes for these uh, meetings. Does anyone have? feels like they would love to do that. You know what? I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it because I, I was doing it for like the four working groups and it became too much for me, but I can do this for invasives because we don't even need that much. And so it's, yeah, it's kind of unfair for Pam to have to do all of that. So I've been taking notes tonight, so I'm happy to type these up. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Sure. Appreciate it. Okay. So, um, our next meeting is scheduled for the 17th of October. Yeah. Okay. And the time is the same. It's at 7 PM, 7 PM. Okay. Is there a way to find out? I mean, Pam's not on, but I'll throw this out to you, Lori. If there's a way that, that Sandy could get in and do take, you know, cut some of those vines from that butternut tree that Susan Daly was talking about. Um, 
if there's a way we could do that before October 7th, that, that would be might, nice. It would make that be that really nice. Well. Yeah. Uh, Cause that's obviously the day, right. And then it, also, I mean, the nature center is going to be doing something sometime after that, I think for their program, they're having a, yeah, I know it's so, cause you just want to go and you just want to like, yank them like when i was down yes. at Weed Beach i so weekend. wanted to but our good friend laura mosher said no, i know you can't so or in some she's educating you can't. me <laughs> you can't you can't no reach them, on the vine. i'm so glad you listened i yeah. listened i was not george of the jungle <laughs> i did not swing on the vine yeah so it'll be really interesting to see what the costs come out for doing this versus what yeah. the price is versus 8,600. And this is kind of the, you know, you hate to have to do it, but if this is a better targeted way to do it, and now we're hearing about the runners, um, the, this will make it a lot easier when we're going back and asking for money. For more I think. money, correct. Yeah, because we're not just saying, we're saying we found a better way. Uh, exactly. And it, it, right. Exactly. I think, um, uh, yeah, I think it's the best way, but I, I think as a group, there's so many resources out there, even in Connecticut and also in this Facebook group I just joined on Invasive. It's really amazing. Um, and I encourage people to kind of read people's experiences in other parts of the country. Um, What's it called, Susan? It's, is it just um, called Invasive Facebook? No. Here, hold on. I'll give you the exact name right now. Sorry, I was just going to look it up. And but Victoria, been, I'm sure you have so many called invasive so much plant feedback. ID and removal in the United States and Canada. I didn't hear it. Could you repeat it, please? Sure. Invasive plant ID and removal in the United States and Canada. Um, Great. It has real terrific. I mean, they have pictures, and it's really terrific. How? I mean, we're not obviously. It just makes us feel like. At least when I was reading, I was like, we're not alone in this effort. It's oh, no. homeowners, no, no, no. municipalities. No. But what I am seeing is the parks are obviously a huge factor for a lot of these invasives, especially since we have so much land under management by the parks and beaches. But I feel like it actually should be a townwide effort because we're, the seeds and all the, you know, the berries and all the things from these invasives come from homeowners, other town properties the side of the road. I mean, we just had a tree come down last night, an old tree, and it was covered in invasives. And two days ago, I said to my husband, listen, look at all these trees here. They're covered with invasives. They're under stress. It's just a matter of time before they fall down. Of course, to, last night, one of them fell down on the wires. And mm -hmm. it, the diameter on, I mean, it's just that the, these invasives are weakening the, the trees, you know, like, you know, not allowing the leaves, the, the root systems getting compromised because they're, there's no, you know, they're not able to photosynthesize anything and get nutrients and they're competing with all these invasives. So I think as a town, we need to look at this from a, a more big picture and broader uh, perspective so that we're not feeding the seed bank for these things. We're not encouraging root systems. I mean, like a lot of the, the tree of heaven and all that stuff, there, it's a lot of it coming from property owners, individual, not town properties that have come through. As you see on pear tree, that one, the tree of heaven right there by the picnic area. Yeah. That's, you know, on private property. So Yeah, and they're I down by that, there's a bunch of them down by where the old um school was on yeah. Pear Tree Point yeah. Road. And um I was thinking that somebody so should reach like out to that builder. Yeah. And we you know, everybody should, you know, you I have neighbors that have this these plants and I've notified them. It actually talks about how you talk to your neighbors about it. It's, it's the whole That's thing. great. Japanese knotweed is another one. And it's really amazing. So I really encourage the committee to look at it because I'm very anti pesticide use myself. But when I read this and thought about the long term effects of not using pesticides, I mean, it's like, you know, it's kind of you're, you're between a, hard, a rock and a hard place. You want to do the right thing and not introduce more pesticides but at the same time by doing this we will use less in the future but when you honestly, when you do look at it really prevention yeah yeah when when you do look at the facebook group mm -hmm. since it's the entire united states keep in mind yeah. that what is invasive in montana is not necessarily invasive in the united states and uh, in connecticut so Right. But I just but to be honest, like some so of that the you stuff don't that, get overwhelmed and thinking, oh, my goodness, we have to get rid of 
X, Y, and Z plan. Oh, yeah, I agree. Good point. But the problem is that it's not invasive now. And some Connecticut's not ahead on some of this stuff. Like, there are things that are invasive in New York, and they're not invasive in Connecticut. And they really should be invasive in Connecticut. They just haven't caught up with no. the stuff. And with the warming weather trends, we're getting stuff that maybe would have died back with winter. They're not dying back in winter time. So I'm just saying, I'm not saying I'm taking what they have to say, but I, I think we need to look at it broader than what's on the list. And, and it's like, it's, this. thank you, Susan. It's like, um, it's like being proactive and recycling, right? In the beginning, remember when the Laura was on the RTM with me then when that plastic bag ban first came, yeah. you know, like there were so many people who would not have supported it. And then when it came around again, a few years later, many more, there was, had been a big educational program on it. Um, right. And, and it was able to get passed and people Sometimes people are slow to move towards positive change, but this can be the same thing. Thank you also, Susan, for saying they tell you how to talk to your neighbor, because I was just thinking about that. Like, how do you, you know, do it diplomatically so you don't uh, make an enemy out of them? One, so. one other issue. The town of Darien has a tree warden who is responsible for the trees that are on, quote, public property. Mm -hmm. And there are tree of heavens all over the place. And he recognizes mm -hmm. that. Who does the tree warden report to? Mike Cotta? Uh, uh, probably, I don't know. Is that public works? Um, public works? Okay. I don't know if it's public works or if he's, he's an individual person kind of just reporting into, I know he works with parks and rec with the maintenance. I mean, like I know he works with Sandy Rich. Um, I don't think he's given Monica a call every day, if that's what your question is. But well, no, I mean, in terms of a budgetary, from a budgetary standpoint, um, we're taking on the the trees that are in our parks, but it would make sense for him to take the care of these tree of heavens that are on public property in Darien. I mean, who's we could move into their budget rather than using ours. One of the worst offenders is the education property. Right. All well, the maybe, schools. Maybe it's what we do, I mean, this is going to be a marathon. Maybe we work on, you know, start a tackling in our parks, work on our public education piece. And then once we have that in pace on 79, not only do we try to get, you know, maybe get an article in the paper. Okay. Or, you know, social media. But then maybe we create a, a a public statement and go during public comment in front of the board of selectmen go during public comment to the board of education and have a statement and just say, you know, we are looking for you guys to, to, you know, work with us on this because it is really a community wide issue, but kind of, you know, get our ducks in a row. Okay. And then and yet, you know, remember how there's a, um, there's an environmental um, committee, um at Darien High School made up of the Darien High School students yeah they were part of the whole recycling you know and van bags thing so um I have a friend who's a PTO chair so I will reach out to her and see if there's a way we can start to get the kids involved because much like Susan Daly's amazing daughter and what she's done with the cleanup down at the beaches um our young folks can be the the you know the growing spirit of all of this right. I think Laura, can you just confirm one thing you said? You said that that the education or the schools are one of the, do you mean it's a lot on the school property? The Is property. that what you meant? Oh, okay. sure. Okay. Middlesex Middle School uses burning bush as a foundation plant. <laughs> and, so, that's where, and, and another place then we should, you know, think about is, is getting in front of the, HHR building committee because as they're going through and redoing all these school properties, we want to make sure if they go to the extent they're doing plantings when the building is done that they're not putting in that they're thinking about. Yeah, yeah that's a friend of mine who was, is chairs that actually, yeah. and then Jill also co chairs it. Um, so I'll reach out to both of them. I mean, HHR is a, is on hold now for a little bit. Um, yeah. So that's a great, this is actually a good time to reach out to them. Yeah. Okay. 
That's a great, great point. Thank you, Laura and Lori for explaining okay. it to me. Um, any other comments? I just want, I have a quick question. Uh, is there a reason, so after we're removing all these invasives from the parks and looks amazing, um, is there a reason that we're not planting natives? I understand that there's, you know, watering concerns like the trees and cherry lawn that look fantastic and all over the town. But I mean, right now is a perfect time to plant. I mean, really Sandy's guys could just, you know, get their seeding machine, put some seeds in the ground and then just leave them. And then, I mean, I'm just wondering if there's a plan going forward instead of grass to put in, or maybe just section off certain areas where we can put in, you know, a wildflower meadow that's all native seed mix. I think, I think that was definitely part of Laura right? Mosher's yeah. plan, like once um, we cleared out to do that. Yeah. yeah. I talked to Pam about this today when I was talking to her about the PSU Tree of Heaven stuff. And I think the idea right now, just because there's a lot going on and with the removal and stuff, she said that her sense was that Sandy and the guys were going to remove what they can and go back in and seed the areas they can maintain because as it's easier for the, the crew to just mow, to be honest with you. We all know that. And yeah. Native, and in order to do an adequate planting, I mean, some of the things I've talked to her about is putting a foot of wood chips and then planting between so that you, you don't interrupt, like you don't want to expose the seed bank for too much, obviously, because now once you remove all these invasives, there's a ton of seeds there. And once you bring light to them because you've removed all the, you know, burning, whatever it is, right? Their sunlight is now touching these seeds for the first time and that's all going to germinate again. So there has to be a plan to put things back in. And right now, they're going to focus on putting seed in the areas that they can go back in and mow. Yeah. But I said that they should consider putting in spaces for natives. But as a native planter yourself, you know that natives, just because you put native plants, they don't take care of themselves, you know, because in between, I just spent half a day with Chris Filmer at the Celtics Woods entrance where we had Eversource plants at Pollinator Garden. And they had put in weed, you know, some kind of weed protectant and then put mulch over it. And then they put all these beautiful new plantings and they watered it. But very quickly, it's been overrun with invasive weeds. Mm. And then I went in, you know, Chris and I were meeting on something else in the park and we just sat there. I said, this is what's horrible. I mean, and all these plantings cost so much money, you know, to someone, to taxpayers, basically. And so we went in and we removed all of what we could and cleaned it up. But again, that Thank was volunteer you. work that just person. No, I mean, it's not, I'm not. No, but it looks it. great, Susan. Those photos that, were amazing. Thank you. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, these are large swaths of area and I'm just not sure we have the capability to actually go back and maintain. Because that was my concern with Pam. I said, what are you going to do? You, you know, Sandy's doing a great job. We have these huge areas that are now open and beautiful, but they're not going to stay that way because even we saw at Eversource within a few weeks, a month, everything was overgrown again with invasive weeds, even with managed, kind of a managed plan, a managed planting plan, I should say, you know, beautiful. So that's something I think we have to balance, you're going to have to balance on this committee is how to go back and pr provide something that, that's why I had said to, I've been saying this for a while and it's out there also in public, you know, that a lot of the like these garden experts, I don't. They're, I think their professors are saying do a foot of arborist, arborist chips, which is wood chips that you know all these tree guys bring to the town and dump and have to pay for. Just you know, put a, a big thick layer of it on on some of these areas that we're thinking of planting. Eventually, that will turn into you know that'll protect you know the seed bank from germ germinating, but that stuff will break down and there's no chemicals in it. Hopefully, there's trees, you know. So we're feeding the soil until we know. And if we do want to go back in and plant stuff, it's easy to kind of put things in between. I've been creating islands personally on my own garden, and it's been quite effective because you can target an island and water it and make sure it's viable. And it's, there's more moisture in a place that's more focused than spreading a huge swath of land with seeds. Because even if you look at what Eversource did for Felix Woods area back there behind the gate, I don't know if you know, but what they did was they hydro seeded and they put in, they cleared it out, York raked it and everything. And I got to tell you, there might, 
maybe 10%, maybe 5% of what they planted is still there. It's oh, gosh. again, overgrown. Oh no, you can go back there. I took pictures with Chris. I said, Chris, I don't even think this was in the planting plan. I mean, there's all those invasives because there's the roots are still there. The seeds got exposed. So you're putting in tiny seeds that honestly can't compete with these invasive seeds. They grow faster, stronger, quicker. So they're going to block out light to the seeds that you want, the desirable seeds. So that's a hard situation, you know, not a, a, a easy solution to kind of, you know, deal with, you know? So anyway, I'm sorry. I kind of, over so I your suggestion, too, much I too much. Susan, so your is suggestion to is to, um, to let Sandy do the seeding, as they've said, and uh, yes. have regular yes. grass come up because then it's easier to mow, but then choose particular areas to do some, you know, foot level yes. or whatever you said of, yes. uh, I would do some of the edges, the edges, the, the edges are a great place because they're, do the chips the edges are great because it usually provides a little shade from whatever the the tree that that's you know that was that's desirable and then okay. it cascades and then as those things grow out they come and they spread because certain in natives are they, they are not invasive but they are very happy in certain in the right conditions they can take over our space very quickly like like i'm not saying we do all of them but there are certain ones that are more desirable than not like i wouldn't put common milkweed any anywhere on public property because I've seen what it can do. Like that was originally in the Eversource plan for the entrance and that would have taken over the whole entrance. We would have no other planting. And that's a native plant, which is beautiful and it's monarch friendly, but we just have to be careful with what we put back in and just have a good mix. And so I would we can add defer to Laura Mosher and you and probably Victoria on that, um, I would say. But I like the idea of having a plan going forward. I do think that we, for, if things are coming down, we do want to replace them, but maybe not replace every single one of them, right? Yeah, I'm just not quite sure we're ready yet. Yeah. Right. So I think- No, 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 no but, of, but have start the battle plan, right? Right, and think about it and lay it out and be very thoughtful about where we put things and how we're going to use the, because it's, but by doing these projects, in both cases, we've gained more parkland which is great. And we think about it, we've, we've got more usable park and we're going to have to be thoughtful about how we envision that extra space being used. And in and the meantime, we have to maintain it. But in the meantime, we have to maintain it. And, you know, that was sort of the trick we got into when we planted all those trees last fall. It was just all of a sudden it was like, oh, we got all these trees and we quickly had to be like, oh, shoot, where exactly do we put them? And we sort of quickly scrambled and found out a way to lay them out. But you know, if we had had a few months to, to think about it and some more professionals, would we have put the mo those exact spaces? I, I don't know. Um, so I think we just need that, to be very- That was an interesting opportunity. Yeah. But we did, like with the pear tree plantings, that was more thoughtful and, you know, yes. we, you know, there was more of a planting plan. And Exactly, I because we had- to be like what you're saying. We had a professional. That we just don't yeah. want to willy-nilly stick things in and then find out later. I mean- Honestly, the invasives we see now were actually recommended plants many years ago, just FYI, right. if people want to yeah. know the truth. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. So yes. it's what it is, what comes around goes around. So we just have to figure out what's a good plan and what we can do. And I do like the idea, maintaining space is always, that's going to be the most important thing. And as much as volunteers are great, you know, it's really at the end of the day, the, the parks and rec staff that have to do the, the, to do the right work now. of maintaining. Right. So oh. I think we do need to do something, even if it's grass as mundane as grass, it's better than having the invasives. It's, 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 it's land that's actually being managed and cared for and people use it. So we'll be more cognizant to maintain it versus if it was just woodland, it just keeps on things get overgrown and we don't notice. That's what happened at Cherry Lawn. Okay, so it's almost been an hour. Um, I will contact, try to come up with someone who is an expert in applying this herbicide. I will get back to Pam. Do we need more than one person, Lori? Um, not if it's under what's 10,000, right, Patty? What are you talking about? If on a in terms of a bid, in terms of cost, to apply that uh, herbicide. Well, we want it way under ten grand. 
Right. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we might yeah. want to get a couple of bids just because yes. we don't have any context. Yeah. But... And when we say, and when, yes, yes, estimates, okay. right? Estimates. estimates. I would use that phrase instead of bids for this. I'd say yeah. estimates. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And Laura, you're going to work on the, the education piece? Yes. Laura. Okay. Most yeah. Laura, yeah, we can work together. So Laura, why don't you kind of noodle on how, what you think it would be like, and then we could connect with Jim Cameron. Okay. You know, he might want to do a combination of interviews and I'm sure uh, hopefully you've seen some of the interviews he's done with me, with Pam, other commission chairs, whatever. He does a really, really nice job and he's, he's fun to be interviewed by. He really, he's, he's a professional. He's good at it. He makes you feel super comfortable. Um, you know, and as he said, I'm not here to, you know, gotcha. He's, you know, you kind of prep in advance and, you know, he helps you craft the message and it would probably be a combination of that. And then some on-site visits and, you know, close up pictures and stuff like that. So I think yeah. if we can yeah. noodle about how we would want to frame it out and present it, he'll, he'll work with us and, and come up with a Love really it. nice piece. Love it. And so Sounds many good. people actually watch, you know, you, you you forget how many people actually watch Channel 79 until you're like down at the boat club, right? And somebody goes, I saw you last night on this. I'm like, oh my God, I never watch myself, really. Um, but they, and, and particularly during specific times of years, right? When there's going to be, you know, before budget meetings, before elections, before things like that around Great Island that, you know, I'm sure his numbers jumped way up as people were watching a lot of that. But what's great about it, Laura, is that, you know, he continues to run it. So he'll run that set and he can place it. He'll run that segment before the board of finance meeting, right? Or before an important board of selectmen meeting. Okay. So that's helpful. Or when they go into executive session. Session, yeah. And people are, yeah. So he, he'll yeah, place it there and people are kind of waiting and they're like, oh, and they kind of get interested. Yeah, it, it's, it's okay. amazing yeah. how many people watch so this stuff. It's a great start. And then what you come up, that's going to be all your talking points when he's interviewing, but you, we can then put that together as something that we can submit to, again, the local, you know, Darian Times, Patch, Stanford Advocate. Yeah, we Monica can also have a piece Darian. in Monica's bi-weekly newsletter, yes. you know, with, with the link to the 79 video. Um, but again, Perfect. going before other key boards in town to say, you know, can you please pay attention to this on your properties? Well, I did talk to, um, I can't think of her name right now, of the women who are doing uh, the Darien magazine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I talked to them when they were doing the Greenhouse Group at the DCA and, and I Perfect. told them about the work that we're doing here as an idea for, you know, another article there. So that would be good too. So yep. we just have yep. to blast it on all fronts. Yep. Okay. And we can probably even get it uh, due sometime once in a while at the RTM. Sometimes we're very busy and then sometimes there's meetings where there's only like one thing to discuss and then they're ready to cancel the meeting. And I always say to Seth, our, uh, you know, our moderator, um, there's other opportunities out there that we don't have to just get together to vote. Like it can be an educational one. So this could be a great time. And Laura, since those are all your buddies, you could come. <laughs> you Patty, you're finding all kinds of uses for my extra time, aren't you? She doesn't want Getting you anymore. back in, babe. Getting you back in. Thank you. Thank you. Well, okay. Um, I think um, unless there's anything more that someone wants to add, I think we've covered everything. And we've got our marching orders here. So I would suggest we adjourn. Okay. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank, right. you. Thank you all for Thank coming. You.